Good morning. Welcome to Mount Calvary today on the 20th Sunday after Pentecost, whether you are worshiping with us in person or with us online as a member or as a visitor. Uh, today's service will follow the common service beginning on page 15 in the front of the red hymnal. Uh, readings today as our hymns also remind us of our true uh, value and, and uh, the treasure we have in our relationship with our Lord. We'll begin our service today with the, sing, uh, with the ringing of the bells and then join to sing the opening hymn posted. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful 
and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. our Heavenly Father has been merciful to us and has given His only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by His authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, in your bountiful goodness, keep us safe from every evil of body and soul. Make us ready with cheerful hearts to do whatever is pleasing to you. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Please be seated. This morning's Old Testament lesson is taken from the 10th chapter of Deuteronomy, beginning with the 12th verse, a portion of Moses' farewell address to the people of Israel. So now, Israel, what is the Lord your God asking of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, and to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes that I am commanding you today for your own good? Indeed, the heavens and the heaven of heavens, the earth and everything that is on it, these belong to the Lord your God. Still, the Lord attached himself to your fathers loved them, and he chose their descendants after them. That's you from all peoples, as it is today. So cut away the tough shell of your sinful nature, and do not be stubborn any longer. 
The Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, the mighty one and the awesome one, who does not show favoritism and does not take a bribe. He carries out justice for the fatherless and widows. He loves the alien who dwells among you and gives him food and clothing. So you are to love the alien, because you were aliens in the land of Egypt. Fear the Lord your God, serve him, cling to him, and take your oaths in his name. He is your glory, he is your God, who performed for you these great and awesome things that your own eyes have seen. When your fathers went down to Egypt, they numbered 70 people. But now the Lord your God has made you as numerous as the stars of the sky. This ends the Old Testament lesson. The psalm this morning, Psalm number 27, is found on page 75 in the front of the hymnal. We'll sing the verses and refrain to Psalm number 27. This lesson is again taken from the first epistle of John, chapter 2. Do not love the world, <clears throat> excuse me, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the desire of the eyes, boasting about material possessions, is not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but the one who does the will of God remains forever. This ends the epistle lesson. Alleluia. Love the Lord your God with all your soul and with all your mind. Alleluia. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. Holy Gospel is taken from St. Luke in the 18th chapter, beginning with the 18th verse. A 
certain ruler asked Jesus, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus asked him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except one, God. You know the commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother. I have kept all these since I was a child, he said. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, You still lack one thing. Sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. But when the ruler heard these words, he became very sad because he was very rich. When Jesus saw that the man became very sad, he said, How hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. In fact, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard this said, Then who can be saved? He replied, What is impossible for people is possible for God. And Peter said, Look, we have left our possessions and followed you. And he said to them, Amen, I tell you. Anyone who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will most certainly receive many times more in this time and in the age to come eternal life. This is the gospel of our Lord. We confess our Christian faith with the Nicene Creed on pages 18 and 19. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated for the hymn of the day, hymn number 306.
Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. For consideration this morning, we turn our attention again to the first epistle of John in chapter 2. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the desire of the eyes, boasting about material possessions, is not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but the one who does the will of God remains forever. This is the word of God. Dear friends in Christ Jesus, our Lord, it's not news to you to hear that the prices of things are going up and have been for some time. They sometimes bump down a little, but then they seem to go back up even more. It's part of the inflation that they say we're facing as a country and even as a world. And while it can be irritating and even frustrating for us to have to see prices go up at the grocery store, the gas pump, or wherever else we might shop, we realize that a lot of things in this world come at a pretty high cost. But that's not anything new. 2,000 years ago, there was a cost too, a high cost. And the Apostle John tells us that, that it applied then. It applies still today. That cost hasn't gone down any. No economic plan will bring it lower. And that is the high cost of love. The high cost of love for us as believers and the high cost of love for God himself. Now maybe the words of verse 15 struck you as a little strange when John wrote, Do not love the world or the things in the world. This is the same man, the disciple whom Jesus loved, who recorded Jesus' words in his gospel. Chapter 3, verse 16, probably the best known verse in all of Scripture, where it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. And now here he tells us not to love the world. God did. Shouldn't we? But before we think that the apostle had a change of heart somewhere between writing his gospel and writing his first epistle, we have to remember that the term world is used really in three different ways in the scriptures. One of them is the created world. Everything from day one to day six or five and a half. And then the other time the world is used as a term refers to humanity. And so God loved his creation. He loved it dearly. It was perfect. Why wouldn't he love it? And he loved the people of his creation most of all. But when John uses the term world here, he is not using it in either of those senses. That's what he meant when he wrote in John 3.16, For God so loved the world. He loved not just the trees and the animals, that was fine, but especially did he love the human beings in the world, and so much so that he gave his one and only son. Here, the term world does not mean that. It means instead all that has been corrupted and influenced by human sinful nature. All of the bad in the world here, as John tells us, and even some things that look good, but that are tainted by sin, John says, we are not to love those things. We are not to have our hearts set on them. We would have to file this under the easier said than done category, wouldn't we? Because it's very easy to have our hearts set on this world and the things that are in this world. Because we can see them. We can touch them. We can own them. And so it's not hard at all to love this world. It has a lot of things that are desirable. It could be a simple, quiet afternoon on a lake. It could be an early morning on a golf course. It could be spending time with the children, or the grandchildren, or even the great-grandchildren. There's a lot of things in this world to love. And then the apostle has to go and say something like that. Don't love the world. Bummer. What a killjoy John seems to be, huh? And then we realize the high cost of love. See, when you, when you look at the cost of things in the store, you think, well, they just the prices went up. Price of eggs has gone really high. 
What are those chickens up to? What do they need the money for anyway? We're going to stop laying if we don't pay up? Well, we realize, of course, that it's not the chickens who are getting rich off of us paying more for a dozen eggs. But the people who raise the chickens have to spend more for their fertilizer. And there are other costs that are somewhat hidden. The price of milk has gone up. Well, it's not that the cows are all getting fat off of us, but the people who run the dairy, who provide us the milk, have to pay more to get it to us because the cost of fuel has gone up. Because the cost of petroleum has increased, so has the cost of the plastic bottle in which the milk is contained because the plastic bottle comes from petroleum. And so there's these hidden costs. So the high cost of love is sometimes a hidden cost. In the world that John tells us not to love, there's an awful lot of things we could set our hearts on. And the Lord warns us that we had better not set our hearts on those things and move him out of the place in our hearts that he wants to be, and that is first place. God will not take second place in anyone's heart. God does not want to share first place in anyone's heart. He wants first place and he wants it all to himself. And when we do not do that, we're committing first commandment sins. You shall have no other gods, our God tells us. And so John warns us, be careful. The stakes are high. The cost of love is steep. It may mean for us that we have to say no to our friends who want us to go and do things that the world thinks is perfectly fine and that maybe by itself wouldn't be sinful or wicked, but does draw us away from God, does rob God of some of his honor and the glory that we are to reserve for him and for him alone. The cost of love goes up when we have associates, family, or whomever that say, you know, it's okay to do these things. The world doesn't mind. The world, in fact, expects it. But if God doesn't expect it, if God says it's not fine, then it's not fine. And we may have to forfeit a relationship, suspend or end entirely an association with someone or someone's because what they want us to do is not what God would want us to do. And now all of a sudden we see the hidden cost of love. And it can be mighty high, can't it? You know that if you've ever had to deny a, a, a French, if, you have to have, if you've ever had to say no to someone, if you've ever had to deny yourself, then you know the really high cost of love. When the devil comes and tempts us with the worldly things, all these things that John describes as Negative, the lust of the eyes, the desires of the flesh, all the things the world offers us. Self-denial is a difficult thing to, to do. It's a fine art that is hard to practice, and it comes at a very high cost. But loving God means I love him even more than I love my dear old self. And I love myself more than I love anyone else. My sinful nature tells me I should. God tells me I shouldn't. God tells me to love him first and foremost at all times in every way. And so I realize that, wow, that's going to cost me a lot in my life. Not every day, perhaps. When I'm not shopping for eggs, the high cost of eggs doesn't affect me one bit. And when I make eggs for breakfast, they taste the same. So I'm not affected by the cost then either. It's only when I have to purchase them that the high cost uh, is noticeable. I don't necessarily have to be affected by the high cost of love on a daily basis, but when I am, then the question comes into my life as a Christian, am I willing to pay the cost? Are we willing to pay the high cost of love for God? Well, as we think about that question, realize we're not alone. Every Christian, of course, is called upon to pay that cost, but even we Christians aren't alone. When I'm at my favorite fast food joint, and I look up at their menu selection, and I realize I'm going to have to pay a lot more for a hamburger than I used to, I may grumble about it, but I know the guy behind me is going to have to pay the exact same amount for the exact same burger. Misery really does love company. Well, 
If I have to pay a high cost for love as a Christian, if you do, when you do, when I do, we remember we're not alone. Because God himself had to pay the highest cost of love. In his omniscience, God realized that after he had created Adam and Eve, and he knew this even before he had created them, but he knew that after he created them, there would come a time, not very long afterward, that they would disobey him. God knew that was going to happen. But he loved them so much he made them anyway, and he gave them this perfect world to live in. And then they ruined it. And so God, in his love for them, because the cost of love is high to God, he decided, okay, I'm going to have to make right what they just made wrong. And so he did that in a plan he'd already laid out in his eternal mind before time began, that he would send his son. Because not only is God omniscient, he is also omnipotent, and he has the power to reverse all of the problems that Adam and Eve brought into the world. But it was going to come at a cost. So he sent his son, this one that would have to do what Adam and Eve could not and would not do, and that is to obey God perfectly. And so the son did. And we, we know that, we say it often, but think about it for a moment, because maybe we don't give it enough credence as we should. He obeyed his heavenly father when he was a little boy. He obeyed his heavenly father in those adolescent years. He obeyed his mother and his earthly father during that time as well. So parents, you can appreciate that. <laughs> Adolescents, you will someday appreciate that. He obeyed his mother and his father every day of his life. When he became a teenager, he didn't think he knew it all. Even though he knew it all. Because he is God. And then throughout his adult life, every single day, he obeyed perfectly. And this was part of God's plan. Even though it cost Jesus, the young man who walked away from him, other followers who left him because they couldn't understand the things he said, the fact that he once commented that he has no place to live, even foxes have holes to go into, not the Son of Man. And then to top it all off, of course, out of gratitude for all that the Son had done, out of gratitude for that perfect obedience, in thankfulness for what the Son of God had done, mankind put him to death. And he paid the price. And the Son never thought during this time, well, I don't know, the prices are kind of going up here. Well, love for humanity is starting to cost me more than I'm willing to pay. Uh-uh, never said it. He paid the full price for your salvation and mine and for that of all people. The high cost of love can be terribly difficult to pay at times. We know that. But we're not alone. Our Heavenly Father paid it. It was much higher for Him than it'll ever be for you or for me. But it was a cost He was willing to pay because He loves you and me and all people so much that He can't bear the thought of eternally being separated from His most beloved creatures. And so He pays the price. And that, John says, motivates you and me not to love this world but rather to love God who loved us first and loves us more and will love us always and if that's not enough reason to love God if everything he's done for you and for me is not enough of a factor to motivate us to love him to the best of our ability even though we are still hindered by our sinful nature John gives us another reason. He tells us that this world, and that's beauty and its glory and all of its wonderful things that can tug at our heartstrings, is passing away. We see that in the world around us, don't we? We see uh, in, in a recent hurricane in Florida. We see beautiful homes reduced to rubble. We see it in wildfires out west almost every year. Beautiful wooded lots, nice homes, gone. Nothing but ash. In the Midwest, homes are removed by tornadoes and relocated, sometimes miles away. This world and all of its glorious, wonderful things that can lead us to love them is not going to last forever. But the one who does the will of God will last forever. And the will of God is very simple. It's to believe in the one that God has sent. So that also reminds us to put our love onto something that will last. 
Not that shiny new object in the store, not that thing that everybody else has that we think, well, we just can't live without that. Not that dream we've had since we were this big, but to put our heart and our mind on our God and his will and his son through whom you and I will live forever. And when we are with our Lord in heaven, we will realize how blessed we are there and how much there is for us there. And we will think, why on earth did I put my love on those earthly things? They're gone. But what God has given me in heaven will not be. The other day, I was driving down the highway, had to go visit someone. I drove past several stores. They were all busy. There were a lot of cars on the road, too. And I thought to myself, well, I guess the price is going up. Really hasn't slowed too many people down. Lots of people still drive to work or drive to wherever. I'm one of them. Lots of people still buy stuff. I still buy eggs. I still drink milk. I'm still willing to pay for certain things, even though the prices have gone up. You may be, too, because you think, well, it's worth it. Okay. The price of loving God hasn't gone up at all. It's just as high now as it ever was. But dear friends, there was nothing in this world that is more worth it than the love that we show to God and more importantly the love that he shows for us. If we are willing to pay more for gas or groceries or anything else, may we never shirk from paying the high cost of love because the return on our investment is eternal and it is worth every penny we will ever pay. Amen. Please rise. And now may the peace of God that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. stand as the offering comes forward. <laughs> Heavenly Father, give us the needed health, strength, and abilities to make a living for ourselves and our families. At the same time, keep our hearts from covetousness so that we do not desire more than is good. Do not allow us to be wasteful on the one hand or greedy on the other, but help us to be wise and faithful stewards of all, to use our goods in ways that are pleasing to you. Grant us your grace to praise you with our offering, for they will be thoughtfully, cheerfully, and bountifully given. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God of love, you have said that you love the world so much you were willing to send your Son to save humanity from being separated from you eternally. Your love was not mere words, but actions as well. In time, Jesus was born, lived, died, and rose again to secure the forgiveness of our sins and our eternal salvation. Forgive us for those times when we have failed to love you as we should. Destroy in us all selfish desires that seek only the temporary things of this world at the expense of loving you. Empower us by your love in the, revealed in the gospel to live lives of love both for you and for our fellow man. Help us to see that no matter how much it might cost us, 
loving you and your will is always worth the price, and that one day we will live with you in the home that you have so lovingly bought and paid for, for us. Amen. Special prayers are offered this morning on behalf of Ben Silha and Leah Kramer, who were united here in holy marriage yesterday afternoon. We also remember in our prayers uh, Wyatt Asp, who uh, this past week fell and broke his collarbone. Also, uh, Colin Greeman, he is the grandson of our member Jay Padella. Uh, Colin is currently hospitalized with some very severe stomach pains and discomfort. Uh, doctors are pursuing uh, determining what it was that is causing this and then what to do to help him. We also pray for Mrs. Catherine Martell, who this past week underwent a successful heart surgery. We pray. Lord God, you created man and woman in your image, and it has pleased you to unite them as one in holy matrimony. You have greatly honored marriage by making it a symbol of the spiritual union between Christ and his bride, the church. Grant that Benjamin Silha and Leah Kramer may reflect this perfect love and commitment in their marriage all the days of their lives. Make their home your temple, and make their marriage a testimony to others, so that your name is glorified among us. And great physician, you care for your people. You love us dearly and have provided for our salvation. You also provide us with guidance and strength during our lives here on earth. With this in mind, we come to you on behalf of two young people currently experiencing severe health issues. Wyatt Asp with a broken collarbone and Colin Greeman who hospitalized with some stomach uh, abnormalities and uh, illness. We pray that you would bless all the medical means employed on the behalf of these two young men so that their pain might be minimal and their recovery might be quick. We pray that as they grow and heal physically, you would continue to bless them with a spiritual strength always to put their hope and their confidence not only in the success of the wisdom of medicine, but in your love and wisdom for them as well. And Lord, you do provide us with life and health, with safety and strength. We thank and praise you for having granted to Mrs. Catherine Martell a successful heart surgery this past week. Thank you for blessing the doctors, nurses, and surgeons as they perform their work. And even now, as Catherine recovers, we pray that you would grant her increased physical strength on a daily basis and always help her to maintain her trust in you through your precious promises that you are with her in this life and will be with her as she is with you in the life to come. These and all of our prayers we bring in Jesus' name, who has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We continue with the communion liturgy. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who promised that wherever two or three come together in his name, there he is with them to shepherd his flock till he comes again in glory. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song.
Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen.